On today's episode of The Glue Guys, we will talk about the iconic Game 5, Kevin Durant's masterpiece, and then we'll be joined by one of the greats, one of the all-time legends herself, Mina Kimes, ESPN Nets super fan, is joining The Glue Guys wow. today what to talk Nets episode. basketball. My gosh. <laughs> little rigatone at the end there for you <laughs> welcome back to the glue guys this is mike here say hello, hello brian check us out on twitter at bk glue guys netsdaily.com the athletic get yourself behind that paywall theathletic.com slash glue guys brian michael the nets are we, back. we did it we really they're back we had a special From the dead we had a special game mike something special happened last night why don't you tell us all uh, about it do you feel do you feel like something <laughs> special happened it, it, I mean, it felt like we, I was, uh, we, our new friend, new friend of the show, Bill Abiri from uh, New York Magazine, he went to the game and I was DMing with him before the game and I was saying, it could be a special moment, James Harden's Willis Reed moment. Mm. It wasn't exactly mm -hmm. that. We'll get into James Harden. Complicated. Um, yeah. But the Kevin Durant performance, if you're listening to us now, you probably have heard it a thousand times already. Wow. Yeah. A real wow. Yeah. Brian, how are you feeling? Uh, good. How, first of all, Mike, how's Augie? How's Augie too? Yeah. So the Ryan, I love, we love to do a live pod after the game. We love to do it on YouTube. If you haven't been a part of that culture yet, jump in on the YouTube. We'll tweet out a link last night after the, probably the most iconic Nets game mm. since the Nets went to the finals. Um, maybe even more so than when the Nets went to the finals. Uh, my, my 10 month old decide, decide that jerk. Yeah decided to become all Devo on me. Yep. Is Devo the, the masculine version of Diva? Devex. Devex, yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, and he was just coughing and hacking, and I was up with him until 2 a.m. Just covered uh, in, gonna... in baby vomitus instead of live streaming what was, you know, an incredible <laughs> game, but that's okay. Well, you know, that's fine. There's no – got it's got to be done. And, and here we are now to celebrate what is um, – yeah, I don't know what else to say except should we just, like, bathe in the glory of it? I mean, like, we can get critical at some points about the whole thing, but, like, no. for a second we do need to just, like, let the KD splendor wash over our mortal shells, right? I mean, like, that just needs to – we need to feel that deeply fair yeah i mean the, the 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 thing about it is that i mean there's so many different data points that you can pull out and say wow this was extraordinary right it's a triple double it's the first what was it like the first 45 15 and 10 do, game mean, in postseason basketball history it's like one of those, those weird yeah. mm -hmm. they really levels. wanted that to be 50 um, if it was a 50 you would have made it just real easy that would have been very easy yeah the the 50 15 and 10 club would have been yeah. i mean there's only would have been one person in the club yeah um, kind of like my Dungeons and Dragons club in high school, but the nice. <laughs> not true. D and D that, is for losers. No, um, <laughs> really. To me, the iconic thing is the forty-eight minutes. I think that's the number. If you're to pick a number, he the guy played the whole game. He we literally really, played the whole game. We really went to war. It felt like James Harden and Kevin Durant were like, you know, they had a going down with the ship. D Dido moment, um, you know, together, and and you gotta love it. I mean, so I don't know. We should get into the whole James Harden thing as well. Obviously, everyone's sort of talked about how you know Kevin Durant is had a spectacular game, and that's been great, and that's been joyous. Um, I want to talk about how great James Harden was in this game, Mike. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, well, partly. No, I, you know, I some, actually, uh, I'm, I'm, in about, yeah. I'm in it because here's the thing. About the, so I listen to Bill Simmons' podcast, and I do really love Bill Simmons' podcast, even though sometimes his his basketball takes they're I they're different from mine um at different times but he was really kind of like getting on James Harden for playing at all in this game and he thought it was a bad decision and I was just like I mean the guy gutted it out I don't know how many he played like 42 minutes himself I think in, more, in this game yeah. and the most important thing that he did was that just by being on the floor and being not active and whatever he drew drew holiday mm. away from switching on to kd at times or switching on to whoever and he re his presence required acknowledgement by the milwaukee bucks if he's not on the floor if it's tyler johnson then like brooke lopez is gu guarding tyler johnson and guarding in quotes 
And then the Bucks are allowed to put Giannis and Middleton and Drew Holiday and Pat Connaughton um, on whoever else they needed to and could have doubled the Nets. The the Bucks were slow to react to the fact that James Harden is the like wasn't himself. They just didn't react to it. They they regarded <laughs> his three pointer as like as as though nothing had been happening. As though he had like all the lift in the world, which he like very conspicuously didn't. He was like basically dragging his 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 lame body through that entire thing. Which I mean, like you know, more power to him. It was awesome. You know, <laughs> watching the whole thing happen and him sort of doing his orchestrating from afar. But like they were closing out on his improbable step back threes that like definitely didn't have enough oomph on them to get anywhere close to the basket. Like they were like, we got, it's James Harden. We got to close out on these. (laughs) And uh, I don't know why. And I, and you know, I'm like game six is going to be really interesting. I all, I mean, for, for a whole million reasons, but like um, one of the top line ones is uh, what, what do they do? Do they still regard James Harden thusly? I mean, he is, he is a, a sort of a scarecrow in that game that they like tr- treated as if it was a tank. Like they were like, this is, this is the, this is the scariest scarecrow I've ever seen. We have to do something. Um, and like, they can't, I mean, surely they're listening to the whole media ecosystem. That's just been like, that was an insanely co- badly coached game from the bucks through and through. And it really was, it was like, I, you know, I, we watched it on, on dirty stream on Twitch and I'd had a few high lifes on the, the champagne of beers and almost was in a state of disbelief the entire time because, like, the first half was so unwatchably, like, dishearteningly bad. And it's, you know, I was just waiting for the other shoe to fall. And they just kept getting debated into every one of our James Harden little tricks, these dumb little tricks where he's – and then he started doing his ticky-tacky foul stuff to, to pretty good effect. And it just, like – it just started happening. It just started clicking. And even there was no moment where it was, like, you, like – doing my Howard Dean job because I was still, I was just really <laughs> quietly waiting for them to figure this out. And they just never did. Well, and this is so bucks. It's so Milwaukee bucks. The fact that like, I mean, the whole, the whole meme about the bucks is that they never react to what's happening right in front of them. And that's what makes, I mean, the nets, it, this series, the nets could easily lose the next two games. KD could be completely gassed. The, the bucks could actually now game plan for the fact that James Harden, is unlikely to contribute in a significant factor going forward. But the Milwaukee Bucks show time and time again that they don't react to what's happening out in front of them. And the Nets, on the other hand, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, like Nash is just willing to do sort of whatever it takes to win a game or to do something different to throw the other team off. The, like, you, you know, so I've heard it talked about, like, with Harden being played, the fact that, like, uh, like, Steve Nash as a coach should have said that he shouldn't play. Like as a coach, you should tell James Harden, James, you physically, I mean, obviously when we saw him play the game, you can't do it. To me, it was a great move because Harden just, Harden's presence impacted the game more than his zero, one for 10 from the field, 0 from 8 for 3. I mean, he had like, what he had, like seven assists, uh, which is still like, that shows you how smart James Harden is, even he's bum leg at all. Yeah. Um, you get the sense. Too. I don't know. It was it was that game. Like you know, like I'm sure there'll be a great story written about it in like three months. If the Nets win the championship, it'll be like that game will be the re the thing that propelled the Nets forward. Because without that game, if the Nets are down three two going to Milwaukee. You know, then it's probably it's probably over. It's not over. You know. Um, to your point, though, it was interesting because like the, the the system of the Bucks is like kind of become like a weakness of theirs, obviously in the postseason, like a, a lack of adap- adapt um, adaptability. And uh, to your point, like Steve Nash, like it seems like we do more preparation for this podcast than Steve Nash does for like informing his <laughs> players of what is going to happen. Because like Jim Sherman's like, I didn't <laughs> I didn't expect to play forty four minutes or whatever it was. Um, Weird, you know, okay, cool. Like, weird that that conversation <laughs> never, like, popped up pregame, you know, never got a pull aside being like, you know, here's your minutes restriction based on the fact that you have this hamstring issue that's plagued you all season. You know, just went for it. Apparently, uh, KD didn't know that he was going to play all 48 minutes. Nash is just, you know, he's just calling, he's just calling the full-blown audibles left and right. Um, so, you know, that, ad- that adaptive quality is good at times, but also we took a big... 
uh, like loan out for next for game six here. I mean, that's a lot of minutes to play for guys who are pretty banged up in James Harden's case. Uh, KD just seems good to go. So he's, he's like he's full blown gamer bro at this point. He doesn't care anymore. He's sacrificing his body to the basketball gods um, in all the best ways. But yeah, I just it's interesting to see just how malleable Steve Nash has been to this point. Yeah, and and so Harden has been listed as available for Game Six. Uh, Kyrie and Dinwiddie are not available, which like we're still waiting for like the Dinwiddie thing to flip. I think there was a report I forget where it was, but that Dinwiddie may come back in the finals if the Nets make it to the finals, which like feels like that's if that is actually the timeline. Like you can't expect Spencer Dinwiddie to play basketball then, but so you know this isn't yeah. a Spencer Dinwiddie podcast. Um, <laughs> yes, it is. The that, the funny thing. Back. The funny thing about Nash's coaching in in this game in particular, but sort of over the season, he's not an old, he's obviously not an old school coach. He's almost like the most cutting edge coach right now, where he is most coaches like a reliable, you know, sort of rotation. They like to to bank on they're the Steve Jobs school of air. Steve Jobs, the reason why he wore the tur- turtleneck and jeans every day. Mm is because he didn't want to waste time thinking about what he was going to wear. A lot of bandwidth. He wanted to wake up, put the clothes on, and get working. Yeah. Okay? That's why Steve Jobs wore the turtleneck and the jeans. Steve Nash is is not uh, Steve Jobs. Both Steve's, Whoa. not the same person. Whoa. Steve Nash, he's picking out the button down. He's picking out the collared shirt. He's picking out maybe like a nice little blazer. Yeah. He's mixing it up. Every day it's different. Every day it's a different he's, flavor. He's spending time on Everlane.com. Potentially, he, he, yeah. He's diving in on the the essentials, but <laughs> yeah. also like the premium stuff that they've got. True. It's kind of it's like it's a little it's a little too expensive compared to everything else. So you don't know what's the difference. Like where where's so, the supply s- chain there? Sustainably sourced though, you know, you you pay a little extra for that. That's what they say. Um, <laughs> so no, but he and but what I loved about his, I mean, like the okay, most coaches, Mike Budenholzer, for example, would have taken Kevin Durant out for various points of that game. The Nets could not afford to not have Kevin Durant on the floor. He was so essential to what they were doing. If he was removed for even three possessions, the Nets would have lost all three possessions. They would have been negative six, and they would have lost tonight's game. Every moment he was on the floor. There was a moment in, like I think it was like near the end of the third quarter, which is typically when the stars aren't on the floor anyways, where Durant gets like a three with like 35 seconds left in the third, and a if he's not out there, the Nets don't get that three. And that was a small moment where, you know, if he's not playing on the floor, then the total trajectory of the game is different because of how close it was in the end and the Nets finally overcoming and, you know, just put it on a spare. I mean, it was – it's like this weird thing where I've heard a lot of discussion where, you know, uh, we're never going to forget the Kevin Durant this game, even if the Nets lose the series. And I, I agree that we won't forget the game. If they lose the series – you know, it's it's not going to be as remembered as greatly as like some of the other iconic playoff performances, and it's still the second round. But taken by itself, like how many times in your life have you seen a guy do that in the NBA in a playoff scenario, and where his team had like no one healthy and no one who could dribble the ball beyond him, and the other team was the best defensive team in the NBA. It was just an incredible. It was an incredible performance. Can't yeah. be saying enough. No, it was great. Um, we're going to talk a lot about Mina's going to come on the show, and we're going to talk a lot about Game Six and more about Game Five and stuff like that. Are there any other moments that stood out to you that you? Really, I mean, there's so much we can talk about. Jeff Green, we talk about Blake Griffin, and we're going to do that obviously with Mina. Um, to me, the thing that like remains sort of like the most interesting sub factor in this is like one the the top line is Duran is amazing, and two it's that like Giannis. Like what, what? What fear do you have of Giannis in the end of the game? It's like basically none. The the whole Bucks strategic bucket is like a whole separate conversation for me because it's just so fascinating how that organization is run and how they've let us stick our noses in there um, to this point. I mean, we really shouldn't be in this position. We like James Harden is playing at I don't, what what fraction of himself is he playing at currently? Um, Pretty seventeen percent. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, let's do the percentage. Pretty, pretty diminished. Um, I know you love a percentage, <clears throat> so um, we should not be in the series in this way. Um, and they've they've really stepped on a few landmines. I think, like in terms of Nets narratives, I think like we were just talking about like Nash's 
basically just letting everybody like just die, like live and die out there in game five is an interesting like we're just like we just you know we hucked it we hucked our meat all the way the entire game um and that was like a i would say it's a fairly ballsy decision to let james harden do that and to go the distance that way and particularly like the, so the, the the theme of this nets team is that oh they're all superstars and do they really care? Do they really care about winning? They just want to be in Brooklyn, make money off the court, play together, yeah, and have fun. But they're all sort of they're all scorers. They're not gritty players. They're not the Knicks, right? They're not Julius Randle, right? Um, but this, I mean, like, we we also then forget Kyrie's won a championship, Durant's won two, and James Harden has has done everything he can. Besides, I mean, his eyes obviously hasn't been that great in the playoffs with the Rockets at times. But he's done everything he's can to try to take the Rockets and be the team that takes on the Warriors in all those years. So this is this is a championship team, guys on the team who have, who have won championships. Plus, there's still like the Blake Griffin, Jeff Greens, and James Harden who have won a championship. They would like really love to win one. You know, they would like mm. that would be amazing for them. So true, true. That. that game, I just can't get over. You know, part of the the benefit of my ten month old. Uh, crying all night and mm. be, uh, me having to hold him in my arms oh. uh and and just pat him pat him on his back and say everything's gonna be okay everything's gonna be okay it's it like a, so he was like a bucks fan so i just had to i just had to make i was like i'm so sorry everything's okay um was that i could be on twitter all night mm. reading and reading and just enjoy just, like just reveling balancing in the your phone on your infant son's forehead <laughs> while he <laughs> screams <laughs> in terror and then when a pain. video would autoplay he yeah. wakes up yeah. <laughs> Shit. Damn it! Um, the there the crowd was incredible. Um, you know, so there's a funny bit. I don't know if you know who Nick Wright is. You know who Nick Wright is? Sure. Fox Sports. Uh, I actually went to college with Nick. I'm I'm younger. He's old. He's an old man, but he was he was at college at the same time we were at Syracuse. So I knew Nick a little bit. Uh, his his Nets takes. Uh, have been have been wrong and it's been enjoyable mm. enjoyable to watch you know it's it's good that the nets have a foil online on that way i mean obviously it's a tv show but um they, man, put, they post them the, to youtube he's still online i see him online you yeah. you you talked about this about how in your dirty streams about first half it looked bleak it looked like shit people, the nets are people were about bounced to jump. In six people were looking to jump for sure and, and if, like, the Nets lose, yeah, they could blame injuries, but, like, shit's going to change if the Nets were, even with injuries, would lose in, in six games to the Bucs. Um, our guest is popping on right now. We're going to take a quick break. Coming back, we'll have Mina Kimes from ESPN. Welcome back. And joining us on the show is, it's got to be one of the, the greatest minds on Nets Twitter right now. <laughs> I guess overall NBA Twitter, too. Uh, you know her, you love her. She's on ESPN, NFL Live. She's all over the place. Mina Kimes, Mina. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I was about to say, we don't know that they love me because I have alienated a lot of people lately with my Nets fandom, but I'm, yeah. I'm home, baby. This, this, <laughs> yeah. is, this is my That's fan right. base now. That's right. What <laughs> so the, I feel great. What does that look like? What are the DMs like when somebody's getting, getting nasty? I mean, is it, is it is it proper nasty when they're like you're not a Nets fan? I can't imagine that we have those kinds of splinter cells in the fan base. Um, yeah, no, I've actually found Nets fans to be super welcoming and we're awesome. We're hiring, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's yeah. a good way to put it. Yeah. yeah, I was I was saving a podcast, um, JJ Reddick's podcast, with my friend Miro, who's a Knicks fan, and God, I just dropped like. Two different names. That's not that bad. That's what you're here for. It's context. Anyways, and he he was like, what can we do to get you to the Knicks? I was like, why would I be a Knicks fan? I'm just one of a billion there right in 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 the nets world hashtag nets world i feel accepted Small embraced yeah. welcome I, I love it i was on the that's, jumbotron that's <laughs> the thing that i that i love most about the nets community it's a very open open arms we welcome all because the boat is big and there's a lot of seats it's like a staten island ferry you know on a weekend it's just a lot of space here and we're we're welcoming everyone on and you're one of the people on the staten island ferry uh, right now with the Nets. Um, Mina, what was your, so obviously we're going to talk about game five um, a little bit here. 
just I, I saw a Nick Wright tweet, a, a very aggressive Nick Wright tweet. I know you know Nick. Tell people what what was happening. You you have receipts for what happened with Nick. What happened with Nick? And tell tell the audience what what happened. Nick, Nick Wright's made some real crucial errors in tweeting, which is which speaks to you know he really is very thick skinned. And credit to him in our business. But he has sent me some tweets before games have ended, um, which again not smart because. <laughs> You know where to go but down, man. Like if you're, you know, so he tweeted at me when the Bucks, we have this weird riff going on where he's, he's, I, I feel like a known anti-Nets mm -hmm. persona right 100%. now. And <laughs> I think he started it. I don't remember how it all started. I'm not, I'm a, like a lover, not a fighter, but he yeah. was tweeting at me. And then at halftime-ish, he was tweeting, oh, the two of the big three is here which i also was like dude like harden's like not even half hardened right now we're not doing this and i wasn't planning on replying to him at all but then when things turned around you know i i kind of went for it and did sting falling from the rafters mm. um i also was thinking about taping this podcast because i'll just be blunt with you i, I was i remembered i, I was looking at my schedule at halftime just miserably and I was like, fuck, yeah. I don't want to talk about the Nets with these dudes. Yeah. And then when you hit me up afterwards, I was like, let's go. Like, I'll take this right now. So I was like buzzing. Was, Mike, you so. should tell me what the plan was for the pod. If, if it, if it, uh, well, otherwise, because this is like one of the most glue gaziest sort of plans that we ever had. Yeah. We, we didn't want to descend too deep into darkness. So like, while we, we had, we did not have high hopes for Los Nets, uh, when, going into game five. So I had prepared trivia for you because I know that you're a person <laughs> of the crossword and, and I had a whole there. It was all like based on the nets. Like, so it wasn't like, uh, where, what school did Joe Harris go to? But there was like a UVA, UVA question, right? Um, Actually, I could add, can you do, do a you, UVA one? Just, I just want to know. UVA like, one is so legit the yes. craziest, <laughs> the best thing you'll hear all day. Okay. Oh. And then I'll do, I'll just do this one question, but there's all these other ones that I can, whatever. Okay. Joe Harris is an alum of UVA. A fellow UVA alum is the namesake of a popular soda. What is that soda? The namesake of a soda. So the last name is uh, shared by a soda. The soda was uh, named is it, after. Is it, is it one of the Coke? Oh, it's named after him. Okay. I wasn't the Coke brothers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, wow. Well, it That's can't right. be that mainstream of a soda. Hmm. It it's Mr. Pibb. It's Mr. Pibb. Oh, Mr. That's, Pibb such a good, that's such a good really answer. close. Yeah. Dr. Pepper. It's Dr. The, it's the triple A Mr. Pip. Yeah. So, so it's not, it's Dr. Pepper, but there's, this is a wormhole we're diving into. So I want you to prepare real quick and people, I apologize. We're going to get back to the nets, but this is a bit, so th this goes a lot of different places. So apologize for all this. Dr. Pepper went to UVA. He was a surgeon in the Confederate army. That's, mm. that's great. Uh, so he, he, the pharmacist who created Dr. Pepper worked at a drugstore in Waco, Texas when he created Dr. Pepper. And this is from Dr. Pepper's website. So I, I'm not making this up. They say, legend has it that, that the, the, the person who owned that pharmacy named it Dr. Pepper after the father of a young girl he once was in love with. It's a very convoluted <laughs> tale. Yes, yes, it is. Um, it sure is. So, so as you sipped up Dr. Pepper, that's what that's the origins of it. So that so it was a lot of that. In case the nets were terrible. Yeah. Um could you but, imagine? <laughs> could you imagine? But we're that's here now yeah. and the nets yeah. are great. Yeah. Uh and and Kevin Durant is amazing. And James Harden uh Willis Reed himself into the game. So I have some questions for us. The first question is if, when you when you think about that Kevin Durant game that we just saw. Is there a play, an image that stands out to you, Mina? What's the thing that stands out to you about what you saw in that game? I would say I was thinking about this actually ahead of Around the Horn today because we were like, was this the iconic Kevin? I, I said this is to me like a legacy defining game for KD and undoes so many years of narratives and, um, you know, it, it's fucked up, but like he proved he could put a team on his back in like the craziest way. I, and, and then the, we were saying, okay, well, was there a moment in this game? And there really wasn't. Cause he like, it, it was obviously wall to wall. I, you know, really made the push in the third quarter, but, and he did everything, everything possible that you can do like as a basketball player. But to me, the one moment that stood out was when uh, Harden brought the ball up and like was 
screwing up. It was like deep. I mean, there must've been like three or four seconds. All the call. You guys remember the one, right? And mm-hmm. it, I don't know what the hell was the, his plan was there and just kind of desperation heaved it to Durant. And I don't know how Durant got that shot up, man. The, it was a three, but that to me was like, oh, you are at, like compensating for every mistake that every single one of your teammates yeah. is making right now. It was amazing. The face what do you make? What yeah. are we... That's what okay. are we supposed to make of the Harden performance? <laughs> um, like, it's so confusing, right? Because the whole time I was yeah. like, get him off, get him off. But then like the Bucks kept guarding him. So I don't know, like not going after him. <laughs> How insane so I, was that? The fact that they, I mean, it, it's it, we've, everyone's talked about this, but the fact that the, the, the you have to recognize in the moment that James Harden is not himself, that the, he is a diminished James Harden. Okay. He's a pre-beard Harden. He, he's, he's Samson. Mm-hmm. Right, it's been oh. shaved, but he obviously he saws it on. No. Um, he and, and yet he, they they don't attack him. There was maybe three possessions the whole game where he got truly attacked, but they were more of normal in the flow of offense. It wasn't like they targeted James Harden, and on offense, Harden, like he made some really kind of wild decisions again for a guy who wasn't healthy, but he was incredibly important. I feel in the game because. What he did do was he provided like a five second rest for KD when Harden would bring up the ball. And then like Drew Holiday would be guarding James Harden. Don't know, like no reason why the best perimeter defender in the NBA, but he was guarding a broken. So I don't know what to make it. And then Harden had a terrible pass. I don't know what to make of the, the James Harden game. What do you say, Bri? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, we, we talked a little bit about this, but the fact that they didn't, that they just let him, they regarded him as though he was still just totally fine was, it was total insanity. They, they rushed out on every one of his completely impossible threes that were never going to go anywhere. Uh, and, and then let him D up like Giannis in the post, like exactly the only place where James Harden could do anything effective defensively they let him go and like that was the best moment where like sham was coming over to double and he's like no 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 i know i've seen this, <laughs> yeah, <I got laughs> this, this. turn around jay i <laughs> had a premonition about this 30 minutes ago i i got it um so yeah i mean to to the whole i mean game six again i'll be super interested to see what what if any kind of planning they do around james harden i have to imagine that there's like maybe even just like an overcorrection, you know then they yeah. like spin out of control on the highway because of of how little correcting they did um but i I'm, i don't even know what that looks like i guess i, don't, I haven't seen the milwaukee bucks do any correcting at all at this in the, this entire series so i don't know yeah it was like i was coaching the bucks and they're doing yeah. everything i wanted them to do <laughs> i was like okay yeah yeah, take this you know fade away now um yeah the, the heart was interesting because i was trying to rationalize my mind like why is he still out there aside from the fact that the bucks were treating him like he was normal and I got to think there's just some comfort level with Durant. And, you know, he got to take a few plays off where he didn't have to bring the ball up. Like, I think given the fact that the man was playing 48 minutes, he probably appreciated that respite. And they probably don't trust, you know, Mike James or, or Tyler oh, Johnson. I'm, I'm James. glad they've stopped trusting Mike James. Yeah. Every time Mike James gets the ball and does anything, I imagine him screaming Mike James, <laughs> like Leroy Jenkins style, as he, like, goes to the cup. Yeah. Um, Mike James! Yeah. But uh, great story, great story. Mike James, I've been a Nets fan longer than he's been a Net. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I I think game six is gonna be fascinating because it worked in game five, but you can't play 46 in game six and they're not gonna let him hide in the base. Like the stuff that happened in game five is not gonna happen. So I'm really fascinated to see how Nash approaches things because the, I think you're right. I absolutely, I think the Bucks are gonna overcorrect. I think Giannis is gonna guard KD way more than he probably should. Mm-hmm. And he's going to get punished for it at times, frankly. Yeah. Um, and I'll be curious to see how many minutes ever the KD plays, for example. I, I don't know. I have no idea how they're going to go about it. You almost like you almost want Giannis to guard. I almost want Giannis to guard KD because it's the whole like fouling issue. Like, yes. like and, and Giannis, as I mean, he's obviously defensive player of the year and all that stuff, but he, he really doesn't guard like wings on the level of Kevin Durant. Like that's not what Giannis does. Giannis is the secondary help guy. He's sort of that devastating presence around the rim and is obviously super agile and can get, but he, he, but he doesn't guard the wings as skilled as Kevin Durant really ever. Like he did. I mean, I, and it's kind of like, who do you blame Giannis or Boonholzer for it not happening during the game in game five when Kevin Durant's going off and Giannis is not on Kevin Durant. 
But I, I mean, there's a reason, right? Like there's a reason why it's not happening. It's because one, they don't want to risk Giannis getting fouls on KD. And two, because he's just he, like as great as he may be, like there's things that he maybe isn't the, exactly the best at. And the thing that he, him guarding Kevin Durant for an entire game, it's uh, thrilling to watch. It would be exciting and compelling. But I actually think if it were to happen, if KD got two quick fouls on him, and Giannis is sitting on the bench, game six is over almost at that point. Like if they they get fouls yeah. on Giannis, game six is over. Um, uh, in man, it's going to be so interesting to see. Like, is Harden going to be better? Is Kevin Durant going to have any energy left? Uh, do you, do you, Mina? Did you see what Reggie Miller happened to throw out there? <laughs> Oh, okay. Reggie Miller. I didn't see that. He this? got he got he got owned by like Velveeta. <laughs> okay. They were like, take this shell or like it was some horrible. I don't like it when brands are yeah. owning people, but yeah, he massive so, ratio. So Reggie Miller put out there on Twitter, it was right after game five, and obviously we all saw the spectacular performance. Reggie Miller says, I'm just gonna throw this out here uh to see what the responses will be, which he got plenty of. If you're Steve Nash and that's would you sit hard in and Durant in game six? because of the heavy minutes and push all your chips into the center of table of game seven. Um, Brian, I start with you. Do, do, is this our sound strategy uh, with which to, to follow through in game six, I, which I is heard, sitting hard into I heard on um, Bill Simmons thing talking about like, you know, completely punting on game six, which I just don't think you do. I just don't think you do that, Mike. I don't know. Is that, are people seriously, like people are seriously talking about this? Is this a thing that people are talking about? This is, this is the second time I've heard it. Mina, what do you say about to that? Um, I think that if it's the third quarter and they're down 16 points like they were, then I would consider pulling yeah, Katie. Sure. Like if it feels like the wind probably has shifted so much that it's probably not worth it, you know, like pushing him, I would consider benching. But I certainly wouldn't uh, at, you know, from the jump. And with Harden, it's different because I think that it's less about time and usage and more about is he a liability on the floor? We don't know. It'll depend on how the Bucks approach things. Yeah, I mean, there's, it's, to me, that's like you can't risk games. You just can't. It's like you can't in baseball. You can't waste pitches. You don't want to waste a game six. Like it, it, regardless of what, you don't know what's going to happen in that game six. Like Giannis could hurt his ankle in game six yeah. and then what if you if kevin durant james Harden are in street clothes you didn't have them quickly change in the locker room and then come out and hopefully you win games like I, you have to play it out you have to play it out to the maximum because you can't just like you can't put 80 percent effort in to start because then you're just going to fail you have to go to the maximum and then uh, the mina mina what you brought up which is like 16 points yeah with like eight minutes left in the in i don't know the fourth quarter i, I would push it even further but then you pull. Then you do a quick pull, and you just say it's over. KD does that not point. seem like they do that punts on on like anything. It just doesn't seem like a punter, you know. Well, let me ask you guys this question: If okay, so game five, incredible. It's a gut punch to the Bucks, right? The, the the Bucks had a massive lead, and they blow it. And KD has this incredible performance after the game. Giannis is calling Kevin Durant the best player on the planet, which you, if you're a Bucks fan, you don't really want to hear your best player say. Um, but it's it's also true. Um, the which on which end of the spectrum did Game Five affect more? Did it hurt the Bucks emotionally or mentally more, or did it drain the Nets more? In that going into Game Six, who's at more of a disadvantage: the mental aspect of the Bucks or the physical aspect of the Nets? That's a good question. I mean, it really it just comes down to the endurance of Kevin Durant and. His health. I mean, you know, the dude tore his Achilles yeah. two years ago, you know, so I always am like a little, but it was crazy as like, he seemed to be gaining power as the game went on mm -hmm. in a freaking insane kind of way, um, which is why he's, you know, the best player in the NBA right now. So I think he has a pretty keen awareness of his abilities. Um, I think it, like, it's weird. And as a Nets fan, I think you're, as a Nets fan, I was <laughs> mentally like already preparing for the L at halftime. I was like, this is over. So mm -hmm. at that point, it was just gravy and excitement. I think you're more miserable as a Bucks fan coming out of that game than you are happy as a Nets fan based on what happened. And by that token, I think as a Bucks, like the Bucks 
God, that's so demoralizing in every way. I mean, you know what adjustments you have to make, like we discussed, but how can you look Giannis in the eye after, <laughs> after, after he cowardly ran away from no, um, or Bud, man, yeah. like, geez, Louise, I, that's got to kill. Bud's an yeah, interesting I don't wanna, spot. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, so I, I don't want to get too personal, but Bud, there's something about, I, he is Andy Richter vibes. He's Andy Richter with the beard vibes that I'm seeing, which is interesting to me. But let me, I have another fun question. I'll start with Brian and then Mina, I'll go to you. What is the greatest sin in the game though? Is it that the Bucks were not attacking Harden or was it yes. Giannis, yes. No. <laughs> Giannis yeah. not, not no. guarding Katie? the Harden thing. Harden would do that. I could have attacked Harden. Yeah. I have never made a basket, but I mean, I maybe like in like fourth grade, but anyways, like, dude, what was like, dude literally was on one leg. Yeah. I mean, just, just put him on the perimeter, put him on an Island, do something other than just go like going to him at the post. It's just so, it's so fascinating. Honestly, like when you think about who's in charge of making these decisions and they're like pouring over, like, I imagine there's teams of people that pour over footage of this stuff and they're like, they're, what do they say? What are they looking at each other and saying to each other today? Like that went... Like, how do you not call that number? And this is the thing with, like, Giannis, too. <clears throat> There's, like, as I've been watching this series, a lot of interesting sort of picadillos with him. And it seems like whenever he calls audibles, which he does do, it's always, like, the wrong one. It's just, like, it's never the right moment to do that thing that he wants to do. And it's, like, I don't know like if taking it's... Taking a three with uh, right. 15 seconds left is <laughs> not a good you, idea. How is yeah, it that yeah. he's never been sort of, like, somebody's grabbed him and been, like, hey, like... You're really talented. You could be the best of the world. Like if you just sheer up, trim the fat here and there, and you know these couple of things, and you're gonna be really, really, it's gonna be gravy. They and he just, I guess, <laughs> doesn't doesn't. I, nobody's had that well, relationship with him for years. They were all just kissing up to him and trying to get him not right. to leave. Yeah, you know? just hiring but, his brothers. I mean, Bud, like you said, he looks like Andy Richter to me. Whenever they cut to him on the sidelines, he always looks like a dad who's been asked to like braid his daughter's hair. Like he's so <laughs> befuddled and like, oh fuck. Like, don't die. That's great. I'll be home soon. You know, like <laughs> I, I just, I just pity him out there, man. Like I, it's gotten to the point. And meanwhile, it's our, our guy, Nash, cool, our guy. calm. He's our guy. Hugging, like a, a hugger. Yoga Come vibes, crushing TikTok dances, stern, great hair. Stern, stern hugs, a stern hugger. You know, um, what, what, yeah. What, how do we feel about the post game? Brian, if, if people are on, uh, YouTube seeing this uh, video right now, what do, seminal what do people image. think seminal of seminal image, you know, just, uh, the Nash hug was a beautiful moment. It, it really was like, he was representing the fan base at the moment being mm. like, thank God, Kevin, thank you. Thank you for saving us from the depths of embarrassment. Uh, geez, Steve, Nat, incredible. Let I, I, I do have a question though about the Bucks, which is like, what's your percentage of win? I'm not gonna like. Obviously, does it feel like we can categorize in this way: overwhelming favorite, slight favorite, slight underdog, or overwhelming underdog? What bucket are the Bucks? Like, are like should should the Nets be going to this game feeling confident that they're gonna win, or should it feel more of like the Reggie Miller school of thought, which is like, eh, game six is probably gonna probably a wash it's like it's gonna be over just and then, then it we'll out go there. escape seven yeah <laughs> Any, anytime you start a tweet with just throwing it yeah. out there don't, don't tweet <laughs> yeah. it don't finish the tweet yeah. i think the nets should be slight favorites now which in a normal scenario any team that's up with one left would be major favorites but kevin Durant's not gonna or pardon me uh harden's not gonna be better in two days you know so i think just given the herculean effort from KD and our patron Saint Jeff Green, mm. I think they're they're up against it. Although hopefully Joe Harris remembers how to shoot, so that could also you know work in their favor too. That's Joe, whole, Joe Harris yeah. is such a sensitive subject because he he, I mean, mean as a longtime Nets fan, you know this. It's that he was the he's OG. He's the he's the guy. He's the connective tissue between those disastrous years post Billy King transitioning into this current era. And he's the guy that the Nets fans hold on to so closely. And he's just, he has been uh, horrible. He's been horrible. And you can't expect it to continue. You'd hope it wouldn't con continue, but he's just been so, it's just, if he's different, um, then, then I actually think game six is possible. Like, I do think that's a possible win. Um, before we get out of here, um, you said slight favorite for the Nets. Tell us how the series is going to go, Mina. Predi lay it out for us. 
Wow. Game six and then game seven. How's it, how, if game seven's even going to happen, what's going to happen? I think I did say Nets and seven. This is before Kyrie got hurt. <laughs> uh, I thought the Bucks would be better. Yeah. Just to be honest. But um, I think that the Nets drop the next one and then win at home. I don't, I don't see Milwaukee coming into our house <laughs> and uh, winning. Yeah. Um, so that I would say Nets and seven. Are, are you going to get flown out to Got to one of the what, how ethical, is ESPN ethical not? issues? With, oh, like with ESPN? I mean, yeah. Um, I don't think so. I don't think I, well, if you're listening, you know, Bob Chapek, CEO of Disney, yeah. uh, you know, he's a big glue guy. Doing, a, doing a great job. He's doing a great job. Yeah. yeah. Send me out. I'm ready. That's world. Yeah. You can do that. You can descend from the rafters like Sting. And it just come down. Hopefully Nick Wright will be there. I can land right on him. You know? <laughs> he does is he the biggest the Nets games. hater? Is he the number one Nets hater out there? Who else is there? He's risen besides, besides all, all of, of America. Fans, yeah. Besides like all the, the massive. That's sad work. though. You know what? Let's get into this. Let's mm. mix it up on this. Because um, Nick's, they're always like, nobody likes the Nets. Everything, like the Nets are, no one cares about them. You do. Yeah. It's like when people on Twitter are like, no one cares because if you like tweet about women's sports or something. And it's like, clearly you care. Like you literally just disproved <laughs> that no one cares by caring. Like if you're punching, you're punching down. So, you that know. Cognitive it's... dissonance is so extreme. I don't know what it is about that specific kind of fandom, but like yeah. the the screaming like, fuck Brooklyn or like, we want Brooklyn next chance outside. Oh, and yeah. then being like, you guys, we're rent free in your heads. Like flipping, like just gaslighting everybody yes. so quickly. Like what's happening here? Yes. We weren't the ones Extremely. chanting. What's happening? We weren't saying yeah. we want, yeah. you know, yeah. Madison Square Garden. Rent, rent free. A lot of rent free. Sure. Our owner maybe has ties to the government, but your owner <laughs> is fire. It's Jim mm. Dolan. So a, a beautiful I, musician. You know, in his own right. Just really da- dancing around some stuff there. Um, yeah. Are there yeah. any good owners? Yeah. Oh, uh, that's new- great. That's a, yeah. Yeah. No, is no. Usually, <laughs> yeah. That's why it's like I never say there are no like all team all fans are bad and all owners are bad. Like there's no good fan base or ownership. I need a new um like pet play like like a uh, player to obsess over though mm. because. Claxton, you know, I feel like he's kind of he's in falling trouble. off a little he's, bit. He's having a hard yeah. time staying in these games. Yeah. <laughs> Shan, Shan, Sham it, who I privately call Lance. Mm. Friday Night Lights joke uh, for those who watch. <laughs> Lance Shamit, he he really came through, I he thought, yeah, he's in a big a way. Of moments for sure. Well, yeah. I think I, what I would like as as a, as a Nets follower is you to direct your energy towards Joe Harris. Because uh-huh. Joe needs, he needs the positive energy at this point. Love energy. Yeah. And he, like, he's... It's a, it's a really, it's like, a, it's a really sad. Suit. I know, He's... but Joe Harris, he, he wears Mariners hats, which I like, mm, but I right? mean. Yeah, he he's a Washington guy, right? Yeah. Looks like every guy I dated in my 20s. I can't. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I want him to, to be like, you know, competent. So he looks so sad. Harden was throwing him pity passes, sad. you know, yeah. and I was like, oh, God. I got to say, it is hard to be a role player on the Nets because there is like there's a very yeah. low bar Spotlight. for uh, for Katie, Kyrie, and Hart. They all just they just don't accept any bullshit anymore at this point. Like Brian and I have cataloged the DeAndre Jordan saga. Like this guy was riding high. He was one of the three amigos, and now like yeah. now he's just he's wearing like resistance bands on the sidelines during <laughs> games. I'm ready. Yeah. Like he just wants to play, but he actually maybe he doesn't really want to play. I don't know anymore. I, I want him to be like a taco fall at some point. Right. But we're not in, <laughs> we're not in that territory. We and are that's far really from, from prime him. DeAndre. He wants that for himself too. That's all he wants. He wants a chant yeah. for DeAndre to come out of the of the tunnel. Like you know what I want? I want him to do like a Thanasis Antetokounmpo uh, imitation. Like I want him to like running off the bench, coming in, fouling Giannis, and then running back off the floor. Mm. I'm out on him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, anyway, so Mina Kimes, thank you so much. I appreciate yep. you for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Go Nets. <laughs> Let's do this. Let's do this. Nets and six. Lock it up. Get out of here. Seven, probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs>